In this episode, we will give you practical project management tips. Hello and welcome back to the Project Management Podcast at pm-podcast.com. This is the live stream for episode 490 and I'm Cornelius Fichtner. Thank you so much for joining us again here today. And yeah, as always, since we're doing video episodes here, for those of you who are accessing this episode recorded, not live, remember, this is a video episode. Yes, look for the play video episode link in your podcast app or visit pm dash podcast.com slash 489. Oh no, 490, excuse me. I uh, can't even read my own text here uh, to play this episode with video. So what are we talking about today? Well, uh, personally, I was a little bit disappointed when the latest ANSI standard for project management moved from a process-based to a principle-based standard. Uh, yeah, we gained a better understanding of the underlying project management principles, but the ANSI standard now no longer explains how to actually manage a project. Um, yeah, that's especially devastating for someone who's new to project management. You look at the standard and you read it and you're like, hmm, I still don't know how to manage a project. Luckily, the ISO 21502 standard still talks quite a bit about the how of project management, but at only 42 pages, the standard is yeah, still not deep enough to truly manage a project. And that's where Inside the Black Box Project Management, the book here on the left, helps and author Bill Dannenmeyer uh, lays out the fundamentals of project management in a real world environment. And just to be absolutely clear, while the book aligns uh, with and references the ISO standard, it is by no means a replication of the standard. Instead, Bill explains project management using his very own experience. And here he is. Welcome, Bill Dannenmeyer. Hello. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Oh, Great nice. to have you on the program. Good to yeah. see you again. Where are you joining us from today? I'm in Galveston, Texas. It's a sandbar Galveston, off Texas. the coast of Texas. All right. And for those of you who don't know Bill, here we go. He started his career in the US Navy as an engineering officer. And after graduating school, he worked as a consultant and project manager on projects that involved economic modeling, integration of systems, marketing, process documentation, and starting up companies in the United States, Switzerland, Austria, and I believe also in Germany. Bill founded Black Box in 2006. As a trainer, he has taught classes to thousands of students in 20 states and over 20 countries on five continents with virtual training to about twice as many. Uh, he's worked with a number of clients to establish product and risk management training programs and competencies for their staff. He regularly speaks at Project Management Institute meetings in the US and abroad. Bill, my first question for you is always the same here. What can our audience expect to take away from our conversation today? ISO 21502 seems a bit dry. Let's let's bring it alive here. What, what, what can we expect? Uh, it is. It does seem to be dry. Um, I once, uh, several times, students have told me, you make a real boring thing interesting. And I'm like, it's not boring <laughs> to me. This is my life. Um, I think I bring a unique perspective of the choices that organizations need to make in choosing standards for their work and in creating competencies for training staff and project management. I was a project manager for 20 years before becoming a project management trainer. And as a trainer into the upstream oil and gas industry for the last 16 years, um, I have a couple of favorite topics that usually come into anything I talk about, which is earned schedule management, behavioral economics, Monte Carlo analysis, that kind of thing. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much for that. For those of you who are joining us live, uh, if you have a question, please do use the chat and I'll bring it up and uh, we'll answer your question live here on the program. Let us get started with some fundamentals here. And um, would you please outline some of the key fundamental principles of project management that you highlight in your book and how have these principles 
evolved or maybe remained consistent over the years in our field? Yeah, well, for me, of course, the, the, the basics are what I call the four elements of the triple constraint, scope, time, resources, and cost. And I always stick resources in there because I work in an environment where resources matter. Now, you need to figure out which of those baselines is fixed and use a framework appropriate to the fixed baseline. Um, and another uh, concept is that prior planning prevents poor performance. That's something that I was taught in the Navy. Estimation being the fundament of project management and taking care of your people. Now, the, in terms of the changes that have happened, um, I think the principles are the same, but the tools that we use have changed over time. Um, my generation, I'm kind of like the youngest of the uh, baby boom generation. Uh, my generation um, stands in an interesting place because the generation before us, uh, work breakdown structures, WBSs, and program precedence diagramming method, critical path management, which by the way, I was talking to one of the founders of PMI and he told me that they thought that the Project Management Institute might be named the Critical Path Management Institute because it was so important when they started it in the 1960s. Then my generation comes along and we're the spreadsheet generation. Uh, we come out of business school as the electronic spreadsheet exists. So you, when we talk about a lot of tools, what we're really talking about is spreadsheets. And if you look at our version of project management software, uh, Microsoft Project kind of looks like a big spreadsheet. Um, and uh, my generation, you talk to people and sometimes they don't even know that the WBS is a thing because it's just the left side of a Gantt chart in their world. Now, the new generation that's coming online, and I always have to remember this as I'm writing materials and, and teaching classes, the new generation is living in a world of cloud-based tools uh, like Jira from Atlassian. And so they don't look at everything like a spreadsheet with columns and, and rows. They don't, for example, the stakeholder register for them. We use the word register because that sounds like an accountant's um, slate and accountants used spreadsheets. And then Rickland and Frankston invented the electronic spreadsheet. They may be looking at it in a completely different way. They may just see everything in terms of a visual display. So if you take a project management class in 20 years, it may not look like a bunch of spreadsheets. So those things are changing the tools, but the basics of human behavior um, and of human group behavior, it's pretty much the same. Right. Do you have a real life scenario maybe that you've got where these principles were applied yeah. Uh, in, in various forms, you know, one with the spreadsheet, one with the WBS, maybe. I, I don't know. What well, well um, in terms of the principles staying the same, one of my favorite examples is I, I taught a class in Kalispell, uh, Montana, up by Glacier National Park. And the, everybody was with the U.S. Park Service in the class. It was a fascinating group of project managers who had done a lot of cool projects. And one of the guys in my classes was um, the project manager on the project to rebuild the Old Faithful Inn at Yellowstone National Park. And so they, they had a very interesting circumstance. Their constraints were very real. They had a constraint of time. They could only work in the off season when the tourists were not around. But they also had a constraint of resources they could not move resources during the winter because it would wake up the hibernating animals. And if you wake up a hibernating animal, it'll mess up the hibernation cycle and they may die. So they had to have all their stuff on site. They had to have their whole schedule down to the day so that they get everything delivered and built out during the, um, during the off season. So it was so a class. Very, very plan driven. Yeah. But then um, they had challenges though, because all projects encounter unexpected things. And in the case of the Yellowstone project, um, the first bathroom that they tear off the wall of to reconstruct, they discover 
that back in the 1940s, somebody thought it would be good, a good idea to just insulate the whole place with asbestos. So Great. now they already have all their material on site. They have a fixed time and they had to recalculate what can we do with the resources we have in the time we have, because we're not going to be able to do asbestos remediation this season. And so the asbestos remediation came in the second season, and then they had to do a different set of work in the first season that they worked on the rebuild. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's like a crazy project. Isn't that fun? Yeah, quite, a, quite, an interesting, quite an interesting example. And uh, let's move on to the ISO standard 21502. Um, yes, doesn't sound very sexy, I know, <laughs> um, but it is an important standard nevertheless. Why did you choose this particular standard sort of as the, the, the guiding light of your book? How come this one and not the ANSI standard or, or any other uh, project management standard that's out there? Yeah, and I did look at other project management standards. Um, I, I started out, my, my world was with the ANSI standard uh, that you and I both are familiar with. But then that standard kind of went off the rails uh, when they came out with their seventh edition. The problem was that for my customer base, which is people in the upstream oil and gas industry and downstream oil and gas, but heavy construction, heavy industry. Um, the, the new ANSI standard was just simply speaking another language. Now, there's nothing wrong with Esperanto, but if you have a group of people who are English speakers and you teach them Esperanto to take a class in Esperanto and they're never going to use Esperanto again, it doesn't make sense. And so I had been familiar with the ANSI standard since the first ANSI project management standard came out in 2012. And I had actually done some um, comparisons of the um, ANSI standard and the ISO standard. I said the first ISO standard came out in 2012. Um, I did a comparison of those two standards um, and was doing it at PMI chapters uh, in Texas and around. So I was familiar with it and I already actually had used the ISO risk standard and everybody in the industry that I'm serving as a project management trainer, everybody knows about ISO 9000. So ISO, I had a certain prejudice towards them, but I looked at PRINCE2, but PRINCE2 is mostly IT stuff and uh, mostly in the Commonwealth of Nations. I have met a few PRINCE2 people. And I looked at the IPMA um, C standard, um, and it is a good solid standard, but it just has such a limited footprint, and it's not related to the quality standard ISO 9000, the risk standard ISO 31000. And so I went with ISO 21502, which is the name for their project management standard, because I thought it was um, it was comprehensive. It was um, short and sweet, and it covered things in a logical fashion. It made me think a little bit about some topics uh, in a new way. So I I wrote a book. I, unfortunately, when you were talking earlier, you said ISO 21502 says tells you how. It doesn't tell you what to do, though. It tells yeah, it's you not predictive, you, right? It's, it's more it's descriptive, not, right? Yeah, yeah, descriptive of of do a WBS, it doesn't tell you how to do a WBS. Exactly, it just says you need a WBS or you exactly. could need a WBS, but not exactly. Yeah, uh, yes, so, it, it's, it's a standard, not a method. Yeah, so I right? went looking yeah. for a book that described how to do this. Um, and what I found was there was a book in Italian and there was a okay. book in German, uh, but there was no book in English. So right. unfortunately for me, um, I was locked down in COVID and I spent the COVID year and a half writing uh, the book. And then I um, wrote three classes based on the book. Uh, I didn't publish the book yet, though. First, I taught 12 classes um, using the book uh, for the 2022, I guess. I taught all year using the book and mm -hmm. in a draft form. And then I finalized it based on the, on the learnings in the class and published it January 1st. So if you look up ISO 21502 in Amazon, 
the English book is mine. Okay, excellent. And, and I think this is an important question here. We've already mentioned two or three times ISO, dry, standard, right? How does your book actually take the ISO 502 standard and, and maybe translate it into real world scenarios and, and case studies? And, and how do you demonstrate practical application, how this thing can actually be used by project managers on their projects in real life? How do you do that? Well, fortunately for me, I, I had worked in a bunch of countries and I had worked on a bunch of projects uh, over the course of my career. So I, and also training thousands of people, I listen to my students and hear what they have to say. So I basically um, wrote a narrative of, from the beginning of a project, the pre-project planning, all the way to the closing of the project. And then within that narrative, I give examples and graphics. I think there's like 92 figures in there showing how to do things. And then I tried to give little examples throughout um, saying for the people, just someone picking the book off the shelf, how to read, how to um, apply it and how it was applied. The concept was applied in some real world circumstance. All right. Thank you very much. We are moving on here from the pure ISO standard, and uh, we're talking about predictive concepts for, no, adaptive concepts for predictive products, excuse me, because uh -huh. on Amazon, you mentioned that your book is on Amazon, I saw the following sentence in your book's description. It introduces adaptive project management frameworks and explains concepts that can be brought into predictive projects. Hence the title of this, this section here, Adaptive Concepts for Predictive Projects. Uh, please tell us. What am I talking about? Yeah, pick, maybe pick a couple, right? If, if you got a couple for us. What adaptive concepts do you suggest can be used in predictive projects? And please, if you're an Agilist, don't write in. We don't take any complaint letters. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to say is that it's kind of like when I was cooking for the first time with my wife after we got married, I said, hand me the spatula. And she said, it's not a spatula, it's a rubber scraper. A spatula is something that you use to turn over a pancake. I use the expression adaptive because if you read the literature, that's how, it, that's how it's framed. In common parlance, most people use the term agile instead of the term adaptive. It's kind of like the use in the United States of the word aspirin for a generic analgesic, whereas all the rest of the world um, Aspirin is a branded product name for Bayer Aspirin. Um, adaptive is, for most people, when they say agile, they're thinking about Scrum and they're talking about adaptive. So um, you'll see those two words interchangeable, but agile is a particular thing. Um, and adaptive actually came about in the 1990s before the Agile Manifesto. Uh, it was Scrum came out, in, I think, in 94, 95, extreme programming. And I did manage some projects that were using extreme programming back in the 90s. And in the early zeros, I managed some projects using a, a Scrum. So I have respect for adaptive. It's just that my current customer base is predictive. You can't wake up every morning and decide what you're going to do on the bridge and replan the user story of the bridge. If you're building a bridge, you need to know what the bridge is gonna look like before you start. Um, however, I'm a big believer in not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And there's these concepts within um, the adaptive world, within what most people call agile, and it's just really scrum. Um, for example, time boxing. I love time boxing. I wish I wish they had taught me time back boxing back in business school or the Navy, because you know the idea of saying we're going to have a 15 minute minute meeting, and if you have something that's off agenda, don't bring it up, and if you have something on the agenda, be succinct. I love that um, because it's so much of workers' time 
is spent in meetings and it drives people crazy. Um, another concept in the adaptive world that I like is the definition of done concept. Um, it's a nice turn of phrase. Um, the idea that at the beginning of the um, project, you say what it's going to look like at the end. And instead of having to say a long sentence to explain that, you say, we need the definition of done. And everybody kind of gets that intuitively. So, you know, what is the end product look um, and how do we know when we're finished? That's mm -hmm. essential. So that's I like it. So you're picking specific concepts from the adaptive world and you say this singular feature here can actually be plucked out of adaptive and be pushed into predictive without changing the predictive nature. It could be a 15 minute stand up daily stand up meeting every day where we get together and do that, even though we have a fully plan driven project doing something like that to keep everybody appraised of what's going on today on the bridge is still a very good thing to do. So thank you, Agile Scrum Adaptive, for teaching us this. We're taking that and applying it to our yeah. predictive project. And one more point. I think that when you hear people talk about adaptive versus predictive, predictive is what mm -hmm. people call waterfall, adaptive is what they call agile. People act as if there's two different worlds, the physical world and the high tech world or the IT world and the physical world. But there are physical world projects that should be run using an adaptive methodology. And, um, but if you pick up adaptive books or writings about adaptive or agile, they never bring up a physical world project. My favorite is living on a sandbar in the Gulf of Mexico is post, um, hurricane disaster relief. FEMA must do that using an adaptive methodology. Yeah, you're you comprehensible, right? Your minimum, yeah, yeah, your your minimum viable product for a FEMA is the first thing they have to do, set up the tents for the camp for the people who are working to rescue others. Because if the people who have come in to rescue others or help others get sick, they can't help anybody, and now they're a new burden on the system. So first you do that. Then you set up a medical tent. Then you set up a cleaning station. You know, incremental adaptive um, delivery. Yeah. delivery in a physical world environment. Okay, very nice. Uh, thank you for explaining that. I, I like those examples very much. And um, what I also liked in the ISO standard is the discussion on what happens before a project even begins. I believe Prince 2, correct me if I'm wrong, does talk about the business case. Um, ANSI standard PIMBOK guide kind of yeah mentions it as an aside, but the ISO standard has a clear discussion about pre-project planning. And your book does emphasize the importance of this. Can you talk about the specific steps, procedures that you recommend in your book for this particular phase to increase the chances of project success. So do this before your project so that your project ends well. Yes. Now, the interesting thing about this is that oftentimes this is not something done by the project manager. Yes. So in the world that I'm working in, um, it, it's kind of like the book, What to Expect When You're Expecting uh, for People Who Are Having a Baby. Um, the pre-project planning is what is going on before you see the baby. The baby is the project manager. Now, if you are, or the project rather, not the project manager, if, if you are responding to an external party, a third party, for example, you're responding to an RFP, you're responding for an invitation to tender in the upstream oil and gas industry, there's a whole thing that happened before you saw the RFP. And that thing is done in the sponsoring organization and that's pre-project planning. Now, if you're working on an internal project, an internal project, uh, you probably you may be part of the pre-project planning. Um, if you're lucky, a couple times in your career as a consultant, you're around at the genesis of the, of the project. I, I was around at the genesis of one project I worked on 
in telecommunications where I came up with an idea that I thought would save the US government money. And I was working at a think tank uh, that helped the US government plan procurement of telecommunications. And I took my idea and turned it into a PowerPoint, sold it to the government agency we worked for. They went up to the Senate, sold it to the Senate, got it funded, created this project, saved the government $1.7 billion. Um, now that was the most fun I ever had because it was my idea. I was part of the pre-project planning. Um, the steps of pre-project planning is really a reiteration of the scope steps because the organization that is the sponsor of this work that's going to be done by an external party doing the project has to elicit the requirements. And by the way, I am standards agnostic to the point where I take the International Institute for Business Analysis's um, Business Analyst Body of, of Knowledge, the BABOC Guide of the IIPA. And I use that when I talk about elicitation of requirements because they know requirements better than anybody, uh, business analysts. So meanwhile, back at the ranch before the PM is, has even been named, we have this whole process going on in the sponsoring organization of figuring out what they're going to do, eliciting the requirements, making the concretizing those requirements into um, technical requirements sometimes. Sometimes they leave them at functional requirements and issue a, um, an RFP where they expect the vendors to come back with a statement of work. Sometimes they have no idea how to do what they're doing and they issue a statement of objectives and what they get back from a statement of objectives is the vendors tell them, oh, you have this objective, you need to do the following things. Uh, was that sufficient as an answer to your question? Yes, and, and let me take this into another direction as well, because you've spoken a couple of times about risk management and the ISO risk standard. So let's go back to pre-project planning. Right? How can pre-project planning help me in managing potential risks. I mean, as part of a usual plan-driven project, we talk about you know, developing a risk breakdown structure and doing all that, but that's part of the project, right? So what can I do before my project even starts to help with risk mitigation and, and these unforeseen challenges? Absolutely. Can I? Can I? Yes, absolutely. In, in fact, I think that it is essential for customer satisfaction that the customer actually know what they want. If the customer doesn't know what they want, there's a myriad of risks to scope, schedule, and costs because of the vacillating customer. So when a project manager picks up an RFP or a statement of work that they're getting, the first question, one of the first questions they should ask themselves is, do they know what they want? Um, and that's part of pre-project planning. And it, in my, I always tell my classes, once we get to the um, execution stage and we're doing EVM and ESM and seeing where the project would go, that when the project fails or when it's behind or over budget or everybody always blames the project team. Um, and, and, and the project manager. But really, a lot of times, it's not really the project management and the project team. It's the people who didn't know what they wanted. And it's hard to satisfy somebody who doesn't know what they want. Excellent. Knowing what you want is important. And um, one thing that you wanted is you wanted to make sure that earned schedule goes into the PMBOK guide. So you pushed hard for it. This here is Walter Lipke. He invented earned schedule. And you told me the following. I was never satisfied with the treatment of schedule in earned value management. So I did some research a few years ago and encountered Walter Lipke here who invented EVM 20 years ago. Uh, crazy, but uh, for the first 20 years of EVM, 83 to 2003, roughly 
nobody thought about the utility of predicting time and Walter fixed this. Uh, can you please develop this a little bit, this earned schedule? How what does it we, relate to ISO? And, and what do you do with it in your book? Yeah, what are we talking about? Well, yeah, I, um, as you said, I was always unhappy uh, with the ANSI standard and how it talked about time using money. So they said, um, we'll create an index of time, the SPI, the Schedule Performance Index, and we'll take money, the earned value, and we'll divide it by money, the planned value. And you take money, you divide it by money, and you come up with the SPI to talk about time. And that made no sense to me. It, it, is, it is counterintuitive, isn't it? Yeah, it, but it's so weirdly simple that it's the kind of question that, I mean, I have kind of a simplistic mind. It's the kind of question a 10-year-old child would ask if, if you gave this to a 10-year-old child. But we were way too smart, us big-brained people, using earned value management and never giving an intelligent thing about time. CPI, Cost Performance Index, inside of Earned Value Management, EVM, they use it to project the future. How much is this project going to cost me? Or project it several different ways. What's the range of costs for this project? But SPI, they calculate it, leave it on the table, and you're like, why did they even calculate this silly thing? And so I had about two weeks off, and I did some research, and I found Walter Lipke's um, book in an article called Schedule is Different. He, he also has a book called Earned Schedule, and he has a new revised version of that book on Amazon. Uh, Walter's retired now. He is a friend of mine. After I found his stuff, I called him up. I sent him my slides that I developed, and I sent him my, my stuff because he's the inventor, and I wanted him to tell me if I was wrong. Um, so anyway, what Walter does is instead of just staying on the y-axis, he goes to the x-axis, and, and he says, um, you take the, um, you derive the earned schedule, which is the point in time on the original project plan where I thought I would complete the amount of scope I have completed so I can be ahead. I have 10 shoes. I didn't think I was get 10 shoes done until Friday. I could be behind. I've got 10 shoes. I thought I was going to have 10 shoes done last Tuesday. I can be ahead or behind. And then you take that earned schedule and you divide it into the actual time. And you derive a schedule performance index sub T for time that you can then use to project where you're going to go uh, in terms of schedule. And this, by the way, is the question that all children have been asking in the back seat of every car on family drives in my lifetime. The question of when will we get there? When Are we will there we yet? Yeah. yeah. Are we there? Allow me to translate that over into projects. How does this help me? Does it just answer the question, are we there yet? When are we going to get there? No. It's, it's, it gives us an intelligent answer to one of the two basic questions that every executive manager, an executive manager being someone the project manager reports to, every executive manager has two questions. Question one is, how much is this thing going to cost? Question two is, when are you going to be done? Um, there's a question three, which is, did you do what you said you were going to do? But you know, uh, we'll get to that some other time. So we're now able to, and I show it in the book, we're able to plot out a box. I, I don't go into, I think in the PMBOK, there's four or five different EVM calculations. I think that's spurious precision. I think we can say what happens if we keep on screwing up in the future, like we're screwing up now, or we continue to do great in the future. You can do that. And then you remember a thing um, that came out of GE, the, um, there's an effect that they studied, starts with an H, can't remember off the top of my head, which is the Hawthorne effect. If you, you can Google oh, yeah. Hawthorne effect, which is once observed, people who are screwing up tend to stop screwing up as much. So 
you can say if the Hawthorne effect is here, we, we can't keep on screwing up in the future like we screwed up in the past. So what if we came back to original plan? So we take the classic EVM formula of actual cost plus the, um, the budget at completion minus the earned value. And you do that in time language also, the um, actual time plus the plan duration of the project minus the earned schedule and you bound the question. Now we have two boundaries on the y-axis with those two CPI formulations of, and projections, and we have two uh, lines on the x-axis of time, and we can tell our manager that this box is where we think we're gonna wind up on this project. And then the, our executive can make decisions about resources and utilization of staff in order to accelerate it or just kill the project altogether, take the money and the time and the resources mm -hmm. and apply it elsewhere. From your best understanding, is earned schedule something that many of the software tools include and do right these days? Great question. Your, your, your questions are so insightful. Cole. Because when, when I listen to you, my, 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 my eyes started to kind of glaze over and I'll go, Say, it's very hard to visualize yeah. this. It wasn't all in, of us do it automatically. I want to be able to push yeah. a button. Do they it, do it? It was not in Pinbox 6 even. And it's certainly not in software usually. Okay. Okay. Meanwhile, pro look at Microsoft Project. It only calculates EVM one way. So mm -hmm. what Walter did is Walter has a website, uh, www.earnschedule.com. And he has a listing in there of software packages that actually do, do this. Okay. And Walter is listed like 12 um, packages. And if somebody has a package that's not on the list, pop Walter a letter. He's a real guy. Um, they flew him down to Australia for the 20th anniversary of the invention of earned schedule management because um, he did invent it in 2003. I always say EVM was invented in, two, in 1983. And then nobody thought about time for 20 years until Walter by the way, Walter, a government employee working at Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma, um, came up with this idea. So, yeah, camp, yes. and camp we did put, work. yeah, we did put the uh, link to the website into the chat here on the live stream. Thank you already. so ready. Yeah. All right. Let's move on from earned schedule straight into some more examples here. Um, your book includes 60 examples represented here by roughly 60 faces of, of different people. And what are your two favorite practical examples that you are you know, pulling out of the book and say, wow, these, I think I'm really proud of these two examples here of what you can do with ISO and how to apply it. Okay, very good. Well. I am, um, you know, uh, I think it was Woody Guthrie uh, or Pete Seeger who said that good, all, good folk musicians borrow and great folk musicians steal. Um, yeah. And so I, uh, I, these examples come from my own experience and the experience of my uh, students. Uh, my favorite two that I tend to tell usually every project intro class that I teach and every project risk class I teach. The first one is, um, you, you mentioned uh, Cornelius and I, you know, you pick up on the good details. You mentioned how I emphasize the business case and the pre-project planning of the business case matching up with a project plan in order to be successful. And I tell the story of a guy I met uh, on Sheikh Al Fayed Drive in Dubai, who was one of my former students, who was managing a project in Iraq in the first oil wells that they were going back into after the war. And he looked really depressed. And I said to him, um, what's up? You look pretty depressed. And he said, there's no way I can get this thing in budget and in schedule. The, the, the fields have been flooded for three years. There's an, you know, improvised explosive devices in the roads. We have no idea who the regulators are. We don't know the supply chain. 
The supply chain doesn't know the supply chain. There's all sorts of HS health, safety, and environmental risks to our employees. We're never going to get this thing done on time. And what had happened is this project manager had been given the project, but nobody discussed the business case with him. And I said to him, don't you realize, and I didn't even work for his company. I mean, I was a, uh, I taught classes to his company, so I knew it very well. And I said to him, don't you realize the business case for your project is not to make a profit and it's not to finish on time because nobody can make a profit off of that job and nobody can finish it on time. Your job is to figure out what is the situation on the ground, what, who, are the, who are the vendors, what's the supply chain, what's going on with the fields, what the condition of the equipment is. You need to know that and document that and get that information back to your company so they can make an intelligent bid on the second project where you'll make a profit. So think about the choices this project manager has. If he's invited to some regulator's house for uh, an evening meal, which is a very important thing, hospitality in the Middle East, um, and but his project's behind, he may, you know, if he's only focused on the project, and not on the business case, he'll stay on his project and work all night on the finances, which won't do him any good. If he goes to the party and he introduces himself and he meets people, he understands the stakeholders for the next job, he'll do much better. That I always use that one in intro classes. Very nice. Um, and the other one I'll try to make sh shorter. Sorry for my, I love it. That's okay. We, we, we right no tells us when we have to stop. So. Uh, the other one is uh, the Norwegian um evacuation um a guy told me this story drew drew a little picture i replicate the picture in my book um, you can imagine two squares next to each other with a bridge between them there were two offshore rigs um in the in the uh, off the coast of norway and these are jack up rigs basically that they're they're on the continental shelf they're not way out in the deep water and one of them isn't used for drilling, it's used for hoteling. And the other is used for drilling. And they had a risk plan for what we do if there's a fire. And what they were supposed to do in the fire is put down their work and walk around the catwalk to the lifeboat and get in the lifeboat on the platform they were on, the drilling platform. So on the day of the fire, there was a fire in one of the legs of the uh, vessel. And so they all started to evacuate. As they were walking past the catwalk between the two rigs, there was a guy on the catwalk. And he was saying to them, um, guys, stop. The wind is different today. Now, the, the lifeboats don't have a motor. So the wind, the normal wind was coming from beneath the um, rig and would blow them away from the rig normally. But on the day in question, the wind was blowing towards the rig. And so the guy on the catwalk is saying in Norwegian, a beautiful language, which I do not speak. He was saying, guys, we need to get, we need to go over to the hoteling boat and get on their uh, lifeboats. Because if we get on the lifeboat on the drilling rig, we're going to be blown under the fire. And that's not where you want to be. But all the guys kept on following the plan and they followed the plan and they all got in the lifeboat. And then once they were in the lifeboat, the lifeboats are circular. They were talking to each other and saying, you know, that guy was probably right. We probably shouldn't be in here. Now, the only reason why I know that is because one of the guys in the lifeboat having that conversation was the guy telling me the story. And you know what? They, the guy on the bridge between the vessels, what he did after everybody walked past him and got on the lifeboat? He followed them and got on the lifeboat himself. Now, fortunately, the Hayline suppression system put out the fire in the leg of the, of the drilling rig. But, but this is a point I like to emphasize um, as a practical example. It, and that is that we have a plan for a reason and it's good to practice the plan, but we cannot cannot check our brains at the door of our project. We must always evaluate things in real time and be willing to make changes. Um, and in risk management, that's essential. So I always have that little story somewhere in my risk management class.
Did that meet your needs, Cornelius? That kind of kept me at the edge of my seat. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. This is a life and death example. Um, very There's unusual no in the kind of business that I am in. Well, exactly. Uh, yeah, if, if we're late, if we're late releasing a piece of software by 24 hours, you know, nobody's going to die, right? And, and yeah, if your computer industry. breaks, you yeah, don't your one. Example, Yikes. Yeah. yeah. No, that's the fun thing about physical world projects. I mean, I've worked a lot of IT projects and telecom projects, and, and I teach classes into those groups too, but but physical world projects are just so fun because of it is quite, the stuff quite they do. Different. Quite different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're getting closer to the end of uh, this interview here. i uh, got one more question after this here, and i got maybe some, some takeaways as well. Um, project closure, right? Um, do, do you discuss any common mistakes in your book that people, uh, that people make during project closure uh, in regards to ending your project here? Yes. Um, I, in, in, you know, cause remember in my book, I do focus on my, uh, on physical world projects. One of the big mistakes people make is at the beginning of the project, they don't create a resource checklist is that at the end of the project and notice that I use the word checklist, but in the modern world, it's probably SAP. Um, at the end of the project, they leave stuff in the field. Um, they leave expensive stuff in the field. And I always point out to people that- oh, literally forgetting to take it off? Literally, I there was, oh, wow. guy, there was two guys in a class of mine from a seismic company that they do, they do under earth mapping in a geological sense, who were signing off at the end of a deal with a large oil company that they just finished the project. And as they signed the final contract, the, the guy from the big oil company said to them, so when are you going to come get your stuff? And they said, uh, I, I will come get it in a couple of weeks. And then they walked out of the building. As they walked out of the business building, the one guy looked at the other and said, what stuff are they talking about? And um, the, uh, they, so they went and rented a seaplane because this is, you know, the Kenai Peninsula of Alaska. And they flew up to their site and looking down from the plane, they could see trailers and long copper lines that they used to you know, hook up the repeaters. They had left $50,000 worth of stuff in the field. And for a company to, to waste $50,000 of resources, what that means is they have to go out and earn enough money to take the profit from that money and buy back those resources. Um, the same thing happens in you know, in the world of digital, uh, I once audited the U.S. Department of Agriculture phone closet, or my team audited them, and found 1,000 phone lines that had um, 800 number service connected to them, but were not connected to any telephones and had gone for, I did this in 95, and they from 1975, when they had closed down this call center, until 1995, they had been paying the phone bill every month, $65 a line, a thousand lines, 12 months a year. Yikes. Yeah, it's just a waste. So that's a classic not closing out. And then there's people issues too, because we have human beings we're working for, not documenting the work, good or bad, of the people, not celebrating the end of the project. Those are all things that must be done. Thank you very much for those two examples. They are quite quite impressive, uh, the amount of money that was left on, on the table in those cases there. Yeah, uh, we're now doing something completely different. We are switching over from your book to the Project Management Training Alliance. PMTA um, is uh, a trusted community of project management training professionals who support one another in our industry through collaboration, sharing best practices, and supporting each other as a community. Here on the slide, you can see uh, Tony Johnson, president, and Bill Dannemeyer, board member. Bill, what do you do for the PMTA? What can people gain from the PMTA? Yeah, now, the Project Management Training Alliance, it's not a new project management organization. 
It's a project management training organization. It's a, a community of, of people who do project management training, who collaborate with one another, share best practices, share understanding of the changes in the industry, um, and help one another out. Um, I and you also, Cornelius, at the beginning of this organization, uh, I was around at the beginning. I was too busy to get on the board until this year, but um, I'm on the board this year. And it's it's for people who teach project management. If you are teaching as a subcontractor to a long, large company, you can join as an individual. Or if you have a training company, you can join as a um, as a company and have up to five people from your company um, part of the uh, organization. And what we do is we share best practices, which uh, this is a function that used to be performed uh, by the, what was called the registered education provider community. Um, but that what, that um, previous um, certification went away uh, when the uh, organization- The ATP came. Yeah. 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 Okay, so this is a call to all those of you out there who are project management trainers. Go to pmtrainingalliance.org and take a look at what the project management training uh, association can give you. Sorry, and we'll you training alliance can give you. Yeah. Yes, and we'll let you attend a, a couple of, of sessions uh, for free, so that you can see the utility of it before you have to pay anything. We, this is a, a group of friends. Um, well, actually, I met a lot of people. I met Cornelius through this, um, and I've gotten work through it also, um, just because people are like, oh, Bill, can you teach this class? Oh, you know, Project uh, Microsoft Project, can you teach a day long class for me? So for project management trainers, it's, it's a good thing to have a collaborative community of people who share best practices. Yep. Back to your book, closing it out, some of the takeaways. Um, what would you say are the two, three takeaways that our audience can take away from our conversation today and apply on their projects? Well, I hope that what they'll take away from it is that there, there's more than one standard out there and that the project manager has the right and kind of the responsibility to choose an appropriate standard. Um, all standards will pretty much do the same thing um, as they go forward. And also that that there, you know, for, for the project managers out there, if you've never heard of earned schedule management, it is possible to predict time on a project. Um, and then the utility of the predictive, for predictive projects especially, or scope fixed projects of the ISO standard, uh, the ISO can also be used in an adaptive world. But honestly, if some if somebody asked me that they, you know, was the the Titanic, and they had to grab one book for the project that was an adaptive project, I'd tell them to get the Scrum Guide because <laughs> it's short and sweet and to the point If on an adaptive project. All right. Thank you very much, Bill. Much appreciate your time today. Um, thank you for introducing the ISO standard to us, making it a little bit sexier than what it actually sounds like. And thank you for translating or enhancing the ISO standard with your experience and creating the book. Much appreciated. Thank you. All right, everybody. And that means we are coming to the end. Once again, the book that we talked about is called Inside the Black Box Project Management, Essential Standards-Based Processes and Artifacts, written by William, Bill, Dannenmeyer, MA, MBA, PMP, and obviously you can find it on Amazon. Before we go today, there is something that I'm going to do, and I don't think I have ever done that. I am going to bring up this comment here by Kapil Jawar. And let me put my head a little higher here so I don't get cut off. I am absolutely amazed by this comment by Kapil. I, I blushed when I first read it. He says, Dear Cornelius, growing up listening to your PM podcast has been a pleasure. Seeing you live, hello, was a dream come true. 
your passion, expertise, and engaging speaking style have left a lasting impact. Your ability to simplify complex concepts is remarkable. Thank you. Thank you for your invaluable contribution to project management. Keep up the great work. And now I need a Kleenex to kind of wipe up the tear in my eye. Now, thank you, Kapil, for listening to me and for allowing me into your ears. All right, everybody. Much appreciated. Thank you. Whew. Please visit pm-podcast.com slash 490 for show notes, transcripts, and PDU information. Yes, you can earn probably about uh, three quarters of a PDU in ways of working for listening to or watching this particular episode. Our email address is info at pm-podcast.com. And finally, we have this, ISO 21502 because sometimes it feels like we do need an international standard to remind us how to manage chaos. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kapil. Until next time.